Hello, mathematicians. My name is Matt DeSorbo, covering the algebra sections for Skew the Script. In today's lesson 5.3, we'll be talking about exponential growth and how it relates to compound interest and college loans. Without further ado, let's skew it. Welcome to lesson 5.3 of Skew the Script. Today we'll be talking about exponential growth and how it relates to compound interest, specifically in college loans. The other day I was scrolling through Twitter and saw this tweet that went viral. A uh, simple question is posed here, borrowed nearly $39,000 for school from a private lender. Since graduating, uh, Sarah has paid that lender about $31,000. How much does she still owe them? The answer, surprisingly, is about $47,000 left, which is even more than she originally borrowed. How does this happen? Doesn't seem like it makes any sense. The key analysis today will be when does it make sense to take out college loans and hopefully try your best to avoid situations like this. A quick note before we get into it, there are many types of college loans and many different personal financial situations. Taking out loans for college often does make sense. Um, this lesson will try to help you to make good loan decisions, but you should always talk to your school counselor or an adult that you trust for advising on your own individual decision. Let's get into it. If you'd like to follow along, please click the link below. Uh, you can download or print the guided notes and follow along with us as we go through the video. To start, we're going to talk about how loans work. Um, loans are really important for making large purchases, mainly house, uh, your car, your tuition. Um, these are things that are too expensive to pay all at once. For example, for a $340,000 house, it's going to be difficult to roll up with that amount of cash. So the idea is that people will take out a loan. Essentially, you go to a bank who will loan you a large amount, which allows you to buy a large item like a house. Um, over time, you're going to pay back what you borrowed to the bank plus interest, which we've seen in other skew the script lessons. This basically breaks down into you paying a bunch of monthly payments. And over time, in this case, 360 monthly payments later, you are all set with your obligation to the bank. Uh, these payments are interesting because they cover the original amount plus interest. And that means that you end up paying more than the original amount. Private lenders especially will sometimes make their money by profiting off of this interest. So now we're going to talk about compound interest and how it can sort of get into trouble when, when taking out a loan with too much um, compound interest. Interest is very powerful. Let's imagine you take out a $100 loan. So you get $100 from the bank. Let's say that loan has an interest rate of 5%, which compounds annually, which means each year, each year the amount that you owe increases by 5%. So your principal, um, which is the starting amount, is $100. The interest rate is 5%, and it compounds once a year. If you don't pay off the loan, what's the amount that you're going to owe after one year? So you have $100 principal plus 5% interest, 5% of your $100 principal, um, of simply in this case means multiply, we're taking 5% of 100. So we just get 0 0.05 times 100, that's $5, 5% of $100 for a total of $105 after one year. Another way to do it is think of $100 plus 5% interest or one, uh, $100 times one plus 0.05, and we get a same answer of $105 after a year. Why does this uh, type of algebra work? That's because we're distributing the $100 to the one, which is essentially our principal, 100 times one, plus $100 to the 0.05, which is our interest. We get 100 plus $5, our principal, plus the interest. Um, again, the one is the, the principal, and the five is the interest amount, and it totals to $105. If you don't pay off the loan after two years, how much are you going to owe? We saw $105 after one year. What about two years? Are you going to owe $100 plus five plus five is $110? Not correct, even though it seems uh, easy and simple to do. Remember that this compounds annually. And that means that you get 5% of the interest of the, you have to add on 5% of the interest of the total amount that you owe each year. So after the first year, you owe $105. After the second year, we have to compound that amount that you owe or the $105 with the interest rate. So we multiply by one plus 0.05 to get $110.25, which is slightly more than that $110 earlier because you're paying interest on a slightly higher amount. So again, we can sort of build out the table of how much you're going to have to pay for a $100 principal, 5% interest rate and an annual compounding. Um, so we're gonna take what happened uh, in the past year, 
and kind of uh, work it over and get an additional 5% interest on top of it. So in the first year, 100 times 1.05. In the second year, we add on um, another 1.05 for, for that extra interest. And the new total is gonna be $110.25. We can repeat this. We did this for year one to year two. We can repeat this for later years. So in year three, we tack on another 1.05. We get just over $115. And in year four, we tack on another 1.05. We get just over $121. Instead of writing out this repeated multiplication, I'm going to run out of space soon so we can use exponents. And we can raise this 1.05 to the amount of years that it takes to pay the loan to get the same answer. And now we can just use the pattern because our number of years is equal to our, our exponent. And we can just put the number of years in the exponent to get our result. So for 10 years, it's just $100 times 1.05 to the power of 10, which is $162. After 30 years, that amount's gonna be $432. And after 50 years, that amount's gonna be over $1,100 on a $100 original loan. Whoa, that's a lot. That's pretty surprising. Um, so taking a look at our compound interest formula, we're just going to look at year four here to kind of de deduce what's going on. Our principal, $100, is P, the amount we start with. The interest rate uh, is one, R is the interest rate, so we pay one plus R to T, the, the amount of years that it actually we actually take to pay the loan. And this is our general compound interest rate formula, which we can use to great success in a variety of different scenarios. So now that we kind of understand compound interest and we started to see how the payments got pretty big, let's actually explore how interest and exponential growth are related. So again, this is the same table from before where we saw the amount that the loan costs over time. Um, we saw that between year zero and year one, it's $5 extra. Between year one and year two, it's $5.25 extra. Then another $5.51 extra. It's not increasing too much, but the growth is accelerating. From year zero to year one, we just have a $5 um, increase. Whereas from year three to year four, we have a $5.79 increase. So a larger increase than, than the first year. Once we start to get farther out along the curve, 20 year periods from 10 to 30 years, we see that it's a pretty big jump. The jump goes from $162 to $432. We add $269 between these two periods. And it gets even crazier when we go to 30 to 50 years. We add $715. It's really accelerates. So it's not, you know, that, that's no small amount. This number is getting bigger pretty fast. And this all happens because of the exponents, which is why we call this exponential growth. This happens because of the exponents we're using um, in our compound interest formula. We actually chart this to see kind of how crazy this growth can be. And you can see each dot here is one of the points in our table and the line just slopes up like crazy. Starts off pretty slow. They don't, you know, the dots don't increase a lot and then accelerates and then starts to grow extremely quickly. So the idea here is you want to pay off your loan early before it gets out of hand. So let's return to the example we saw at the start. Um, borrowed about $39,000, paid off $31,000, still has to owe a, a whopping total of $47,000. How could something like this happen? One example is waiting to pay it back. So imagine Sarah from the example taking out about a $39,000 loan with a 6.6% interest rate that compounds annually and the loan won't start until it, after she graduates. So we can go through our system from before. Principal is about $39,000, interest rate 6.6% and compounds annually. Let's think about when Sarah graduates. Let's say she only has enough money to pay for her basic necessities so she can't start making loan payments. She sets a goal of making a large payment after saving up for 11 years once she's accumulated some money. How much is she going to owe after 11 years when she actually uh, begins to pay it back? So let's use our compound uh, interest rate formula, P times one plus R to the T, um, plugging in our principal of P about $39,000, plugging in our interest rate of R about 6.6% to the power of 11, um, 11 years. We calculate this out and we get a whopping 78,000 and a half dollars, $78,525.52. $78, so how many times higher is this amount she owes after 11 years compared to what she originally owed? We divide by the principal or $39,000. We get about two times the amount owed after 11 years of waiting. She owes double the original amount just because she was forced to wait for 11 years to begin paying off 
um, the payment. So now let's imagine that Sarah makes a payment of about $31,500 on this, on this amount. How much will she now owe? So she pays off that amount. She's now left with paying $47,000. That's, that's what's left on her loan. And this is exactly what happened. We're, of course, using kind of estimated numbers to sort of get a sense of how a scenario of the, like this could play out. But this is an example of waiting to pay it back and how the longer it takes to pay it back, the more the amount will, will accumulate. You can see that our number matches almost to the dollar, uh, the number that you reported here. So one quick note before we, we go further, it is more likely that this person in real life, kind of from the tweet, didn't actually wait 11 years to start making payments. It's more likely that she was making small payments regularly that kind of added up to that $31,500. We kind of just used um, the big payment for simplicity in our example. But the point, it remains, these payments weren't big enough at the beginning of the loan to stop the exponential growth. And that's the point we're trying to drive home here. So the idea here is if Sarah were able to pay more immediately, obviously this is a tall task, but if she were able to pay more immediately, $31,500 only two years after graduation, how much would she still owe? So here we have our formula for before with the principal amount, the, about $39,000, the interest rate of 6.6%. We plug in two um, for two years after graduation, that comes out to 44, about $44,000. Um, and if we had paid off that $31,500, we would still have $12,000 left. Pretty big amount, but not as big as, you know, after waiting 11 years. Much better than, than waiting um, and, and having to pay $47,000. So takeaway message is if you have debt, pay it down quickly. Don't fall prey to exponential growth because there are plenty of difficult situations uh, like the one you've seen here. Let's turn, now that we've kind of uh, talked about exponential growth and taking out loans, let's turn to our discussion. Um, so obviously there's a lot of uh, political discussion on these sorts of loans and kind of how these work. Um, for example, uh, Warren and Schumer have developed a plan to forgive $50,000 of federal student loans per person. So to wipe away that amount of loans uh, per individual. So the argument here is if you graduate in a bad economy, can't find a job, you're going to miss your early payments. As we saw, this can lead to debt growing exponentially and finding yourself in a very difficult hole. Another argument is that some people will never catch up and it's very cruel and unusual to keep them in that debt for the rest of their lives. Uh, the Biden plan, um, is sort of similar. We forgive $10,000 and potentially more for state schools. And the argument here is it kind of walks back a little bit from the Warren and Schumer plan. Forgiving $50,000 per person would hurt the budget. It would be too expensive for the federal government. Um, and prestigious private school graduates don't necessarily need debt forgiveness because they have more opportunities to earn and, and pay down that debt. So sort of a, a revised version of the Warren and Schumer plan. On the other side, the opposition, uh, Mitch McConnell, um, plans to his plan is to address the rising cost of college, but not forgive loan debt. His argument is that forgiving federal loan debt is not a responsible use of taxpayer money. It's difficult for the budget, um, and incentives uh, may be out of line. Forgiving the debt would incentivize irresponsible use of money and joblessness, joblessness among college graduates. So clearly, a complicated issue um, where, with many different sides and, and discussions. So our discussion question is: Where do you stand on sort of the student loan forgiveness that you've seen? Do you like the Warren Schumer forgiveness plan, the Biden forgiveness plan, or the McConnell opposition forgiveness? Um, why do you think that? And make sure in your answer to address the threat of exponential growth when you discuss it with your classmates. That's all for this section of Skew the Script. We'll see you next time.